Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. I don't think Peter had prepared a, all night long what he was gonna say, but because you came in, 5,000 were saved that day. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you do again today what your heart's desire is to do, and that's to draw everyone into a relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. It's Holy Spirit, again, have your way. Have your way with every person in this room. Have your way with me. We want to know what it is you want us to know. And amazingly, that may be different for every person in this room. And you are the amazing Holy Spirit who speaks to each one of us in the way that we need to be spoken to, saying the things that we need to hear. So Holy Spirit, we just, we're amazed. And we just ask that you do everything you intend to do today as we continue to worship through opening your word. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to make sure that you know that if any time during the service that you need prayer, uh, the cross that we have back there, we always have our prayer warriors are kind of uh, aware of what's going on back there. So you don't think you have to wait until a certain part of the service. If it hits you and you think, I need somebody to pray with me right now, just if you'll go back to that cross, I promise you, someone will come back. They won't attack you, but they'll come back and they'll say, how can I pray for you? Because we always want to be sensitive to the movement of the Holy Spirit in every way. Um, if he's not here, then we're just having a social gathering. And uh, while I love y'all, I didn't come to have a social gathering. I, I, came, I came to meet one-on-one um, -on -one with the Holy Spirit in the communion of this church. Um, I, I do, I just, it's, it's kind of hard for me to have this many of my family in the room without be gushing a little bit. I love being your pastor. I really do. But I much prefer being their pappy to being your pastor. And I love being your pastor. It's like, I love, I love you more than ice cream and ice cream is very good. Okay. So, so that's, a, it's, it's, it's a good thing. So we're going to go into the, the, second ha the second chapter of Ephesians and the second half of that second chapter. We began last week, and, uh, and I, hope that it was, uh, I hope that it was a good message for you um, that, um, you know, we are saved by grace through faith in the works that Jesus did on the cross. It's not our works. It's his works so that no one could boast because we like to boast. Even if it's, even if it's just, uh, oh, I got here before you did. Okay, well, I mean, we, we, get, we get that ego up in there. And, and like Leo was saying, though, that, that while Jesus and the Holy Spirit have done the work for us, now we work out of the work that they've done for us because they have given us this newness of life, this relationship with the Lord, because they've given us that, we want to work out of that, not for it, but out of it. Once we realize what's been done for us, it should make us want to, you know, man, I just want to do everything I can possibly do for the Lord. I, I, um, I've got this down late in my notes, but apparently I'm supposed to say this now. Look, I, I know, I know what it takes to eat healthy. I know what it takes to work out. I know what it takes to live a healthy life. Work. It's not, now I know, I know if you, if you read, if you believe everything on the internet, which I do, um, you know, you just take this one pill three times in a day and your blood sugar will be zeroed out for the rest of your life. The only way there's a pill that will make your blood sugar be perfect forever, it's called cyanide. And if you take that, you die, your blood sugar is immediately fine, okay? That, but, but, I mean, don't we, we're a microwave society. I want to just, I just want to, I just want to buy a product. I just want to, I just want to read this. I just want to, you know, but the, the discipline 
being a disciple is a discipline and being a discipline means saying yes to things and no to things it's 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 a, both of those things and so because of the holy spirit we can do that and we can be everything that god wants us to be so um uh, i was thinking about um uh, i know uh, i know 1979 seems like <laughs> the dark ages we did have uh running water at our house. Um, <clears throat> but in 1979, my high school music, uh, my high school choral department and band, we did Fiddler on the Roof. Um, it hadn't, it hadn't been out that long. No, it actually been out like 20 years by that point, but Fiddler on the Roof. How many of y'all have ever been in Fiddler on the Roof? Okay. The same year that I was in Fiddler on the Roof in, in Pompano Beach, Florida, Sally was in Fiddler on the Roof in Memphis. That's pretty cool. Uh, well, at least one of my daughters, were you in Fiddler on the Roof? Both Emma and Julia have been in Fiddler on the Roof. If you, you know, if I were a rich man, yeah, 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 yeah. I wasn't big enough to play uh, Tevye back then. I was, uh, I was Perchik the crazy student, okay? Um, Paul by, played by Paul Michael Glazier, Starsky from Starsky and Hutch. There's a lot of stuff that goes along with that. I was a cool Perchik. Um, if you don't know the story of Fiddler on the Roof, Fiddler on the Roof is about Tevye. Tevye is trying ever so hard to, be, uh, to, to, to carry on Tradition. That's the that's the song that we repeat. Tradition. Da -da 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 tradition. The tradition. And here was the here was one of the biggest issues that he had, as 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 in in Russia where he was in Russia and and they were being pushed out of eventually pushed out of their home. Um, he had three. He had three strong-willed daughters. I have no idea what that's like. He had three strong-willed daughters, and they all they all went against tradition and with each daughter it became increasingly more a break of tradition the first daughter she was she'd gone through Zidal the uh, no uh, she'd gone through um the uh who was the matchmaker matchmaker uh, whatever yentl so she'd gone through and and she was going to be married to butcher the butcher laser wolf okay she didn't want to marry the butcher laser wolf he was the same age as her father he smelled like beef he did she did not want that and so she wants to marry um uh, model the tailor i can't believe all this dialogue is coming back to me because i promise you I didn't memorize it back then. So, so, so that, but they had to have this whole thing where they could set aside tradition so she could marry the guy that she wanted to marry. Well, then the next, the next daughter, she's going to go through the, you know, matchmaker, but she, she avoids that. She marries Perchik, the crazy student who's a radical who gets arrested and sent off to, you know, to, to, to be in, in prison because he had these radical ideas that, that, you know, we don't have to just live by tradition. And then the third daughter, she literally falls in love and marries a soldier of the enemy. And with each of those, um, with each of those, uh, um, uh, Tevye is having to decide, you know, it's like, she's my daughter and I love her, but there's this tradition and, and goes back and forth. Now, as a young Southern Baptist in Pompano Beach, Florida, I didn't understand a whole lot about Judaism. And, and uh, there's a picture in my yearbook and it's me sitting with two guys who are named Cohen and something else very Jewish. And the caption under his mic, we're Jewish, we get it. But, uh, but because I, and I didn't get it, but I didn't understand how important the tradition was. When we get into Ephesians chapter two, you have to remember, this isn't something that's been going on for years and years and years and years. This is a, this is a relatively new thing where, where there's these Gentiles. There's the worst thing in the world is being a Gentile. The prayer of every Jewish man was, I thank God that I was not born a woman nor a Gentile. And what they thought about a Gentile is Gentiles, God created Gentiles so there would be extra kindling to keep hell really hot. Okay, that's what you might call a, a bigoted um, bias against a particular racial group. I mean, they, they felt that way about the Gentiles. The Gentiles weren't real fond of the Jews. And now Paul is saying, okay, you two warring factions, in the name of Jesus, you're going to come together in unity. So, so it was more than just when we sit here and we read in our Bible and go, well, you know, have you noticed any, any uh, tension out in the world today between uh, Jew and Gentile, between black and white, 
male and female, rich and poor, Republican and Democrat. I mean, we, if you haven't noticed, they are trying to make us keep fighting with each other because as long as we're fighting with each other, we leave them out of the, we leave them out of the fray. So, so I think this ties in so well. Why would you want to preach through a book in the Bible? Because every book in the Bible, every story that comes from the Bible relates to something that's going on in our world or in your life right now. And so that's why we're in uh, Ephesians chapter two. So um, the temple, by this point, the temple has been made. It's no longer a tent. It's an actual uh, building, a dwelling. And the, the temple was, was the... Um, it was like the best example ever of segregation, okay? The outer court of the temple was the temple, the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles is where anybody could come, okay? You, you could come, if you were a Gentile, it, what, it didn't matter where you are. I, I really believe that this is where they had set up the, um, uh, the, the, the tables and, and when Jesus comes in and he cleanses, I think it was this. And I think it had a lot of, to do with the fact that Jesus was like, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what my father's house is, not the Jew and not the Gentile. I want everybody to know that my father's house is a house of prayer, not a house of illegal business because it was definitely illegal business. But then you had this, you had this outer court. It was the court of the Gentiles. Now, and, and as you walked through the court of the Gentiles and you're walking towards the next segregated group, there was a wall. They say it was about four foot high. And there, there were signs everywhere that said, if you are not Jewish, I dare you to step across this wall. If you step across this wall, you probably will not survive the experience. Now, I don't know what that sounds like in Hebrew, but that's basically what it was saying. Don't come past here if you are not a Jew, okay? Then the next level is the court of the women. The court of the women. Guess what, ladies? You are better than Gentiles. You could go into the, you could go into the court of women because you were Jewish and you could go into that but then there was a barrier that stopped you because then it was the court of the Israels, Israelites. And the court of the Israelites, they didn't mean all Israelites, they meant male Israelites. So there was another level of segregation. And then beyond that, what? There's the police that only, there's the holy. And only the, only, the, only the priests can go in there. Only the temple priests can go in there. And then beyond that, there's the holy of holies. There's one person on Yom Kippur, one person selected, one person could go into the Holy of Holies per year. I, I, there may have been other, other opportunities, but, but so if you do the math, how many people could get into the Holy of Holies under, under that Jewish system, under that Mosaic system? How many people could get into the Holy and Holy of Holies? By right now, about 3,000 people have gotten to get into the Holy of Holies. Can you see now why it was so important that Jesus tear the veil of the temple from the top of the bottom because mo none of us would even have a shot at it but no jewish woman would ever have a shot at it and most jewish men wouldn't have a shot at it matter of fact most jewish priests would not have a shot at it and jesus made it be where all of us can enter in to the holy holy, holy of holies not only enter into the holy of holies but guess what we become the Holy of Holies, where the Most High dwells. Did you, did you know that about yourself? Well, I heard that. I know that about other people, but I'm not sure about you. The Word of God says that you and I, with, if we are in Christ, then we are the dwelling place of the Most High God, okay? It's kind of a long introduction here, isn't it? That's okay. So it's pretty exclusive. So here we are. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. How are my kids doing? Are they doing good? Okay, good. They're being so quiet. You kids, you might need to wake your parents up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made of the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Well, Paul, just tell us what you really think. Okay. You knew you were uncircumcised because the circumcised told you you were uncircumcised. 
You were un, you uncircumcised. Here's a list of what, what you, you were separated from the Messiah. Even though they were Jews and didn't accept Jesus, they, they were they still counting themselves as in with the Messiah, alienated from Israel. You have no share of the blessing of the family privileges. Strangers to the covenant promises, having no share of the blessing of being God's chosen, having no hope not being led to an eventual promise. Um, one, of the, one of the people I listened to this week, Alistair Begg, I love listening to him. And he said, he said for, those of, for those who were, it, who were circumcised, they were going somewhere. They were always on their way to somewhere. They always had a destination. God had, was sending them to the promised land. God was sending them somewhere. But for the uncircumcised, we were in a hurry to go nowhere. We had nowhere to go. It's like, where do we end up? You end up, you end up as kindling in hell. That's, what, that's, that's, your, that's your ultimate goal. So when he says you have no hope, we had no hope. And then number five, without God in the world. Now, but Mike, God's always in the world. God is always in the world. God is in everybody's life. God is, hell, God is moving in everybody's life, but many people reject the movement of God. And if you reject the movement of God, it's, just, it's, it's almost as if there's no God at all because he's not, he's not able to do all these miraculous, incredible things that he is absolutely wanting to do for all of us. So those are those things. God's chosen people, they were in, and those of us who are not Jewish, we're not children of Israel, we're not Hebrew, we were out. Okay, and that's, uh, Paul, Paul makes that very, very clear. Verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus, you who, were, you who were once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I love those buts, right? But God, but because of Christ, but because of the work of the Holy Spirit. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I, keep, I hear that song. He came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his. It was an old song, but it's pretty cool because we couldn't get up to his level. I got out the high chair. I couldn't do it. I got out the tallest ladder I've got. I, I, I tried to build a tower, uh, the Tower of Babel, because I was going to climb. We cannot in ourselves reach God. He had to reach down to us. And that's exactly what Paul says. But now Christ. So 14, 15, and 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down his flesh of dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Now that's a that's one sentence. Um, Paul, if I ever have been accused of writing run-on sentences, I learned from Paul, okay? But we're, I want us to take that and break that apart because there's, there's just so much there to unpack. Verse 14. I, th I think that when we see this, we see two, two different things that Paul is talking about. There is hostility between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And there's hostility with those out of Christ and those in Christ with the Father. If you are in Christ, God is no longer hostile towards you and you are no longer hostile towards God. If you are not in Christ, God is still hostile towards you. So when we talk to our friends who are not believers, we, we don't wanna sugarcoat the fact that, well, God's just a God of love and it's all good. If you are not in Christ, he is still hostile towards you, but he is hostile towards you and offering you a peace treaty through his son, Jesus Christ. But you've got to take that peace treaty or you remain in the hostility. So, so it's two different kinds, two different kinds of hostility. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. He, Jesus, is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus has come in and he has broken down the hostility barrier between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Well, how does he do that? By making them put together. 
I love those pictures of, of these oversized t-shirts and uh, moms who have children who can't get along and they make them wear this t-shirt and the t-shirt says our get along t-shirt. And it's like, you're both, you both their heads coming out of the same hole, you know? And it's like, you guys are either going to figure this out or you're going to kill each other. Well, Jesus has done that for us and he's brought us together. He said, okay, uh, uncircumcision and circumcision, I'm bringing you together. What he's not saying is uncircumcision, I'm bringing you to circumcision. Nor is he saying circumcision, I'm bringing you to uncircumcision. He is, he is bringing them together in a whole new thing. Every morning, well, not every morning, some mornings when I'm trying to behave and I don't stop at scooters and, and get the peanut butter power thing that I'm sure has zero sugar. <laughs> except for all the sugar that's in the drink. But I'll go home and I have these really cool protein drinks that don't have much sugar in them, okay? Because I'm not supposed to have a lot of sugar. Julia quit making sugary things at our house. So, so it's, it's, this, it's this beverage that I keep cold. And then I go to the freezer and in the freezer, I have frozen strawberries and frozen banana slices, okay? You see where I'm going with this? I take the frozen strawberries. I take the frozen bananas. I take my little bullet shake thing. I pour the liquid in there. I put the strawberries in. I put the bananas in. And then what do I do? I drink it down. Well, if I drink it down, I would still be getting protein drink. And then every once in a while, I would eat a frozen strawberry. And every once in a while, I would eat a frozen banana. But, but they wouldn't be blended. But what I do is I put it on that thing and bzzz, you know, I, I wake everybody in the house up with my noisy thing. And then when I drink that, I'm no longer drinking protein drink and eating strawberries and bananas. I am now drinking and eating a blend of those things. It's a whole new thing. That's what Jesus is doing. He's taking the circumcision and the uncircumcision and he's making a new thing called the Christian, the believer in Jesus Christ. It wasn't about being circumcised. It wasn't about being uncircumcised. It was about being a follower of Jesus Christ. So how did you do it? By abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. This word, uh, this, this word that, that we're looking at here about how he brings us together, he abolishes the law of commandments. The New Testament is huge. The Old Testament is huge. Put together, it's the full picture. You can't just do the Old Testament. You can't just do the New Testament. They're, they come together. They, they complement each other. They work well together. So, so to say, oh, so there's, you know, don't ever worry about the law. Don't. But the law, keeping the law is not what saved us. Jesus is what saves us. Now that we're saved and the Holy Spirit is dealing with us, we may go back and, you know, there's some, there's some laws there that we really should adhere to, or, or I, I feel like the Holy Spirit is, is, is adhering to me. But, but they were saying, no, no, you, you got to do all of these things, not just the Ten Commandments, but the 300 other things and the 4,000 other things and the other things and the other things and the other things. And, the other things. and, and Paul's saying, no, no. That, that, that goes away, abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create himself one new man in place of the two, making peace. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about R.T. Kendall being here. Uh, another thing that, that was in his book this week about grieving the Holy Spirit, but he was also talking about quenching the Holy Spirit. And I wrote this down because I knew this would come in handy today. He says this, anyone who superimposes the Mosaic law on believers seriously risks quenching the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't come to help us keep the law better. He came to bring us to life. And in that life, we follow the Holy Spirit step by step. Okay. So many people make the mistake that it's to be one or the other. And it's like, no, no, it's a whole new thing. He's made us a whole new thing. And it's where all the power is. Verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That word reconcile means to return to the previous unity. 
reconcile, return to the previous unity. How much disunity was there in the garden? Zero. That's what he's returning us to, is zero hostility. Zero hostility with God, zero hostility with brothers and sisters in Christ. Zero hostility. That's what he's taking us back to. Um, I, I read this, and I'll, I'll go ahead and share. This is a website called Overcoming Violence. Um, it says this. The gospel features account uh, the the gospels feature accounts in which Jesus is linked to non-Jews. Among these Gentiles are the wise men from the east, the Syrophoenician woman, the good Samaritan, the Samaritan woman at the well, and at least two Roman centurions. One of the purposes of these passages is to demonstrate that Christ's good news is not restricted to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but extends to all. So this is a great time for us to just just take a step over and say the racial debate, okay? We we know that it's it's everywhere. Uh, it, it is absolutely but when we look at it, what are we talking about? There are those people who honestly believe that that racism is a brand new thing. It's never been anywhere in the world, but it started here in the United States. And because I'm white, I'm a racist. There are people who believe that. Now, I, I know there are white people who are racist. I know there are black people who are racist. I know that there are Indian people who are racist. I know that there are people all over the world that are racist, that if you're not the same color as them, they hate you. They think they're better than you and you're worse than them. But race, that, but that's not the only place that we see it. We see where, where men feel that way about women or women feel that way about men or, you know, uh, People, people who are who are uh, who are born in this country think that about people who are born in other countries. We always laugh about, you know, when you live in a state, you must make fun of the people in the state south of you. I mean, that's a rule, right? You know, it's like you know, I can pick on Alabama people, but you know, Kentucky people get to pick on us. Unless you know people from Kentucky, you can pick on them all you want. But we see all these racial divides, and what do we do? We we highlight the differences. And we make them be, we make them be, I'm better than you or, or you're worse than me. We even do that. I think we even see that. Um, well, I'm, 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 well, I'm going to hold off on that. Racism is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as belief in the superiority of a particular race. Okay. We know people will say, because I've, I've said it, there's only one race the human race, but that's just kind of like poking somebody in the eye. We know what they mean. What, they, what, they, what they're talking about is ethnicity or, or, or something like that. Um, I, I grew up in South Florida, like I, I've already told you in the 1900s, and um, ah, just some of y'all like that. Some of you are like, oh man. Uh, and there was a lot of racial tension in South Florida at that time. Uh, we had a lot of people from, from Haiti who were, who were floating onto the shore. We had a lot of Hispanics who were moving up. We had a lot of Cubans, people who are Cuban and people are, who are Hispanic. For those of us who might look and go, they look the same. They're not. And they knew it. And, and so then you had blacks, you had white. And, and um, there, was this, there was my friend Roderick Sutton. He would ride his bicycle to my house. He lived about two blocks farther away from the school and he would ride his bike to my front yard I would get on my bike and the two of us would ride together all the way to the middle school you know and that was what we knew and and so um I remember the day that I said to him I because you know all this conflict and all this all this racial tension was going on and, and I said man I I want to ask you a question but don't be upset I don't know how to refer to you anymore because I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm supposed to say, I don't know what word I'm supposed to say. Am, am I supposed to say you're black? And like that, he goes, black, I am pecan tan. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the end of our conversation. Well, Mike, why does it even matter? Why do you have to see color? Well, here's why I like to see color. Here I have this picture that right here that, uh, sorry, Carter. Yeah, okay. Um, I think black and white's fine. But I love to see color. See, I don't think that we all need to see each other with no color. I think we need to appreciate the color that everybody brings to the, pa the picture. I love the fact that when you look out at a group of people and you don't see all the same color people, you don't see all the same color hair. That's the reason I dye mine. You don't see all the, 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 you don't see all the same everything. 
God has made us a tapestry of beautiful things woven together. So, so rather, than, rather than avoid it, rather than, rather than get in a fight over it, just say, you know what? I, I think it's cool that God has made people in so many different ways. I, I mean, some of us remember the Star Trek Enterprise, the original one with Captain Kirk. I mean, that was awesome. You had, you had Klingons, you had, you had people from all different races, all different, you know, I think in the later, they went a little crazy, but, but it's good. God created us all differently. And then in his son, he brings us together. That's important. So it's okay to see color. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think it's really cool. Um, I guess this applies, and I'll say it anyways. I was reading this morning uh, about uh, Harrison Butker. M many of y'all know he's the kicker for the Chiefs. He went to a, he, he was invited to a, um, I believe, a Catholic school, and he gave a beautiful uh, commencement address. And immediately, people picked out two or three things that he said, and immediately they were trying to cancel him. See, it's like we're all about inclusion unless you say something we don't like. And then we're going to cancel you. So here, here's, I want to encourage you in this. The speech was 20 minutes. Do not make a judgment call until you've gone and listened to his 20 minute speech. Because I can promise you the people who are fired up about it have not listened to his 20 minute speech. And for those of us to defend it, it's kind of, it's kind of equally wrong for us to go, well, you know, I heard the three seconds here you're talking about. And if you listen to the three seconds before and the three seconds after, go ahead and listen to the whole 20 minutes and then have a conversation about, okay, here's what he was saying and here's what it meant. And even if you don't agree with it, he, it's his opinion and it's okay. So, so we need to do that because, well, you don't vote like I do, you're out of the herd. You don't think like I do, you're out of the herd. You don't spend your money like I should think you should. That all of the division, is, it goes against who we are in Christ. Now, does Jesus bring division? Yes, between the lost and the saved. But once we're in the saved, the division goes away. We're this beautiful protein drink that Jesus has, has put together. And that is, that is a, a, to me, a huge benefit. Verse 18, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the father. We have access to the father through the spirit. I'm standing in line. I'm, I'm waiting in line to go see the father. And I look over, there's a guy who's not like me. He didn't talk like me. Doesn't think like me, doesn't vote like me. But guess what? He's in the same line I'm in. Hey, man, how are you? It's good seeing you. I'm Mike. We, we have got to begin to dwell way more on the fact that we have access to the Father through the Spirit. The same Spirit is in me, is in that person. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to agree about everything. You're still going to think chocolate ice cream is better, and they're going to think butter pecan, and they're wrong. But, but you know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that we're all going to be identical, but it means that we're going we're to be able to walk with each other hand in hand. That is part of what Jesus has done. So if you haven't gotten it by now, if you are in Christ, you have no, you have no right to be a bigot. If you are in Christ, you have no right to think you're better than anybody else. If you are in Christ, every person you see is a potential brother or sister in Christ or a brother and sister in Christ. That's how we have to look at the world because we, we, we want to, they'll know you are Christians by your Facebook post. That is not how that scripture goes. They'll know you're Christians by the way you do this or the way you do this. They'll know you're Christian by your love. Okay, that's really important. Uh, the, the next little section, 19 through 21. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The first time you walked into our building, somebody uh, hopefully welcomed you. Somebody showed you where the coffee was. They showed you where the restrooms were. They showed you where Pastor Mike hides the candy. They, they showed you all that stuff. But 10 years later, you're the one who's showing people around. You've been brought into this. And as you become more and more comfortable, you be, you're, you're just an extension of, of this body. We are an extension of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. So we're no longer strangers and aliens. We're not. We're fellow citizens. We're not just newbies anymore. We're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, now so many times when Jesus would, would speak, he would say in the law and the prophets because he was using the scripture that he had available to him. And, and he was talking about the law and the prophets, which is absolutely completed in him. So it's still valid. But what Paul is saying here, he's saying, so through, through the apostles and prophets, through, through the apostles and, uh, and prophets of the day, who, what were they saying about Jesus how are, they, how are they presenting Jesus? That's what we have to do. If somebody who does not have a foundation in Jesus Christ is struggling to make sense out of their argument, they've come up with this beautiful design about how, how everything is not based on Jesus as the cornerstone. It's based on this. It's based on that. It's based on this. It's based on that. It may today it's based on this and tomorrow it's based on that. Is it any wonder that they're confused? They, they, they are building, they're building everything on, on shifting sand. They're building everything on something that's not real. We build everything on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. So we're solid in what we believe. So when those people come and, they, and you know, we know you, you, have, you have built your house in, in a mud pit. And we're, we're affected by what they say. Well, you should do this and you should do that. It's like, no, no, my foundation is built on Jesus Christ. I'm good. That's the reason that we can be loving because we're speaking from a place of strength, not a place of weakness. You, you might knock me, you might, you might knock Jesus right out from underneath me. They can't do that. Stop thinking that they can. They can't do that. So verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Household of faith growing into the holy temple. You and I are a living building. Now, in case you hadn't noticed, sometimes as you get older, your body falls apart. You, you, you just, you know, but spiritually in Christ, we get stronger every day. We get stronger every day. We become more and more secure in who we are in Christ and who Christ is in the world and, and the work of the Holy Spirit. And we just become, ta. We, and people look at you and go, how are you? How did you stand through that? that? That wind came through and knocked me down. It didn't even phase you because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. He is the cornerstone. I'm attached to him. And guess what? It's not even me holding me to him. It's him holding me to him. That's huge. And then finally, verse 22. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for the God, for God by the spirit. We are a dwelling place for God. Um, do you and I desire to be a dwelling place of God? Yeah, yes. But what if there's a cost? Uh, well, what is the cost? Says I, I need to, you know, the Bible says to count the cost. Um, what is, what do we supposed? Yes, I trust God and I want to be his dwelling place, no matter what. And because he's good, we can trust him. He knows everything. We've done this before, everybody. He knows everything. He has all power and he's everywhere. It sounds like we need to be on his team. He knows everything. He has all power. He's everywhere. So, so Holy Spirit, this is your prayer this week. If you would join me, Holy Spirit, 
I can't believe I'm the dwelling place of you. I can't believe that. So first of all, would you, would you kind of give me a little glimpse of how you feel about me? And be, be ready to be shocked. Some of y'all are gonna like, I already know, he can't stand me. You're gonna be shocked when you realize he's like, dude, I have your, I have your, I have your drawing on my refrigerator. I love you that much. So Holy Spirit, show me what, it's, what you think of me. And then how can I be a better dwelling place for you? I just wanna be, I don't wanna be better because I have to be. I wanna be better because I can be. That's what I want. So Holy Spirit, I just thank you. I thank you for every person in this room. And I do pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to every person in this room in a real tangible way, how much you love them. The doubt, the questions, all of that stuff, that it would be, that it would be moved aside and that they would see, they would understand that you love them with an everlasting love. And then Holy Spirit, that I just pray for, for all of us that we would be willing to say, yes, Lord, yes. I say yes and amen to whatever it is you have for me because I trust you, because I know that the best place to be is in the center of your will, because I know that if you call me to do something, you will provide everything I need to do it. I, I, know, that, I know that if you're, you're gonna bring me into a, into a place that seems dangerous, you're gonna go with me. You don't just go with me, you go before me, you go after me, you're above me, you're below me and you're inside me. I'm good because of you. I pray, Father, that you would bless us this week. I pray that we would, as we deal with um, our family members, as we deal with our friends, as we deal with the people who we work with, who, who they, they, have, they consider us to be their enemies, they, they have great, um, uh, they're just against us that they would realize that not only are we not against them, but we serve a God who is for them and that they would come to know him. I pray again to Father that you would just bless us this week. I thank you for our kids that are in here, that you just give them an incredible week as they uh, get out of school and, and uh, Lord, just bless our, our summer. We love you, we thank you, and all of God's people said in the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. You can be dismissed. If you